All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the No Fear Job Search webinar series. Uh, my name is John Shields. I'm the marketing manager at JobScan. Uh, if you're not familiar with JobScan, uh, we're a Seattle-based company dedicated to making the best online tools for job seekers. Um, so we put together this webinar series in response to all the stress and strangeness in the world and, and job market right now. So our goal with this is simply to get as many job seekers as we can in front of the people and the tools that can help them right now today. So uh, this webinar is the first of 15 in the No Fear Job Search webinar series. So we hope to see you in some of the other sessions as well. And you can check out the entire schedule at jobscan.co slash no dash fear. All right, so hi everybody. Um, and thanks again to JobScan for um, inviting me to come down here and present to all of you today. Um, we're gonna be talking about how to optimize your resume, which um, I believe is the key to the job search because um, if your resume can make it to the point where a human being sees it and you can get a phone screen, then you get an opportunity to move towards getting a job. So I believe the very first part of this uh, journey is to learn how we do resumes now in the year 2020, which is distinctly different than the way we did it even in 2016. So first of all, who's talking to you? Well, this is a picture of me with my cat Mulder. I have two cats, Scully and Mulder. They're double rescue cats from a sci-fi nerd. And uh, Mulder's my little pal, as you can see. So we'll talk a little bit about my background and what brought me to this place where I can present to you around this. Um, I've been involved in tech in Seattle since the early 90s. I graduated from college with a communications degree and realized that I wanted to get on the tech side of things and didn't know how I was gonna do it. Um, and through some good luck and some hustle and some phone calls, um, I lucked out, I ended up at a tech startup. And uh, a lot of my job journey, my personal job journey has been really eclectic. Um, I don't know that I've had a job that required an application of any sort since my first job at McDonald's when I was 16. So I, I'm a big believer that you can get jobs in unusual ways or through um, non-traditional means. So um, if I was to work with you, that's one of the things that you know, you'd know about me is I think there's lots of ways to get a door open. But today we're gonna to talk about uh, resumes. So you can see a little bit more about my background. I worked at Wizards of the Coast for 10 years. I've been an independent consultant. In uh, 2016, I decided to become a professional coach and get all of my eclectic information put together. And one of my first jobs that I got when I got out of coaching training was working in career transition at a local um, career transition and executive coaching firm. And uh, in that role, I worked with hundreds of people um, who were coming out of major corporations who then were um, processing the fact that they'd been let go and then went on to go for their next job. So this is all done by uh, a lot of honing, hundreds and hundreds of people that I've worked with. And this approach has really helped them to get, get work. So normally I present all, all the material, but you know that we're going to be having lots of, you guys are going to have lots of different webinars with different coaches talking to you, different consultants. So we're going to focus just on the top end of this, which is the part that's in green. Um, we'll be talking about how do you get the interview first by how do you avoid being in ATS, which is applicant tracking system limbo. A lot of people apply for jobs. Maybe you haven't had to apply for a new job in five or six years. And uh, the resume that you paid someone to design for you and everything is wonderful. Um, it just doesn't really mesh with today's world in terms of how computers are reading our resumes and then flagging the ones that are the, that seem to be the best possible ones for humans to review. So we want to avoid being stuck in limbo because we didn't have enough of the right language in the resume. We want to get seen by a human. And then ultimately, this section that you and I are working on together is about getting a phone screen or an initial interview to get the process rolling. So to stick with our theme, you know, uh, you can see all the keys here. And one of the core ideas of this presentation is that um, we have tools now so that your resume can be like a key that fits into the keyhole or the lock of the job description. So one of the advantages we have, uh, and we'll talk about here in a second, is that we now have tools that allow us to figure out how do we cut this key so that it can fit into the lock enough that it'll turn it. 
If your key isn't cut right, you won't turn the lock and nothing will happen. You might not even get a rejection email. You may end up just literally in the, we're not sure if we even saw the file. And uh, I believe that even if the first couple times you take this process to heart, if all you get is a rejection email, just understand that somebody saw your resume and had to decide that you weren't the right person for the job versus a computer never even putting you up for review. So in the resume, there's just a couple of real basic things. I'm a huge believer that you have to be really authentic in your resume. So your resume should be truthful, really reflect your career, your career, your skills, the things you know how to do, and it needs to be tuned in this way we're talking about so it'll match your job description. And then the second part here is it needs to be keyword optimized. So one thing that I kind of glazed over here at the beginning of the presentation is part of my career as a consultant was doing search engine marketing and search engine optimization. And in that practice, when you're out on Google, right, you're trying to find the right language so Google can help people find your site. All that training that, and things that I've done related to SEO come into play here. So I'm gonna teach you some tricks of thinking like a person who does search engine optimization on their resume so that you can get uh, the call that you wanna get. Also here, you'll see, we're not going to be talking about this today, but this work that we're talking about does feed back into your LinkedIn. And uh, there's, I'll talk about how I use it in that way. And then we'll talk a little bit about job search and like, how do you find roles to begin with? So the resume. Well, um, as I shared with you, right, this is the key that we're going to cut to match the lock on the job description. We want to be truthful and tuned and keyword optimized. And so here's some best practices. When you have a resume, it needs to be easily read by humans and computers. This is one of the things that has changed quite a bit. You know, we, what we, in the past, even in the last few years, you might've hired a, a resume designer and they worked with you on your resume and got your language right and uh, arranged everything on the page. But the way they designed that resume might impact whether or not the computer can read the, your resume. Okay, so that's something to consider and we'll talk a little bit about what to do about it. Um, it's very important, and you can go do research on this too. I spend a lot of time on YouTube listening to people's webinars and things on this topic, and the general rule of thumb is stick to standard fonts and file formats. So we're talking about uh, Calibri, uh, Verdana, Ariel, uh, Times New Roman. Um, you know, if you use Times New Roman, you might look kind of formal, depends on what industry you're in, but uh, stick to the basic font set, nothing fancy. Um, that Microsoft Doc format actually is the, the best format, um, although you'll get a lot of advice to say use a PDF, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why using a PDF might be an, an issue, um, okay? And then um, we'll talk about how to get your resume and your job descriptions to design linguistically, and you see already I have a reference to job scan. So before jo John and I met to work on this particular series, um, I was already using JobScan very regularly in my practice. I didn't have a pre-existing relationship with JobScan. This is just um, happenstance. It's brought us all together here, although uh, it's been great to get to know John and um, it's been a lot of fun here get, getting this put together. So we'll be talking about how to use JobScan um, as part of the resume process. So um, it all kind of uh, meshes up. And then the other thing to share is the first wave of having your resume go out is to appeal to a recruiter, most likely. Okay, you might, need, you might go directly to a hiring manager, but the odds are good if the company's of a sufficient size that they've either got an internal or an externally hired recruiter. And um, you wanna make sure that they can scan your, pay, the, your resume in 10 seconds. So the, the computer's gonna scan it and a human's gonna scan it for 10 seconds. So it's really gotta get into their brain right away, almost like a snapshot what they're looking for in the job. Um, and then depending on where you live, th that could dictate the size of your resume. However, most of the time, two pages is fine. And anything that's more than 10 years old, you should uh, edit down or edit out, partly because the person who's gonna be talking to you um, was under the age of 10, most likely, when, they were, when you were doing a lot of the work that's on your resume. If you're older like me, I'm 50. So 10 years of experience is all that really needs to be in there. So whatever you're doing before 2010, that's old news, I just have to tell you. Um, and then if you're newer to the job market, one page is fine. 
no problem there. And if you happen to live in San Francisco, there's just a different hiring culture there. And there's a big emphasis on having one page resumes, which, where you really do focus on what have you done the most recently and who have you worked with the most recently. So there are gonna be some cultural differences. However, this approach, I've had clients all over the country. I've had clients in Washington, DC, clients in uh, Milwaukee, clients in Dallas, all up and down the West Coast. And they've all used this. They've all accelerated their, uh, their job search and got jobs, I believe, much more quickly because they had resumes that followed these ideas. So, yes. So. Question from, oop, where to go? <laughs> we got a question asking about if you have a preferred uh, font size, um, best font and size to use on a resume that is kind of your go-to. Yeah, I don't go lower than 10. I tend to focus on 10, 11, and 12 size fonts. And when you see some, I'll show you a couple of examples here, and, and I think everyone will see how you can create a rhythm in a really straightforward format using size 12, size 11, Calibri, and Calibri Lite, which is all that's on these resume designs that I'm showing. Great. Okay. So I'm going to show you guys a couple of examples. Um, of how, how this looks. You could probably create your own variant on this, and I'll talk a little bit about what is the philosophy of the resume design as much as what is the design. There's nothing super inherently special about what I'm doing, except that it allows you to really organize your information in a way that gets the right upload into an applicant tracking system and lets a recruiter scan your resume visually very fast. So this would be a typical two-page resume for um, for a client, and uh, in fact, if this one has a is a little bit more towards everything but the kitchen sink. If you're wondering what the yellow highlighting is, it, um, normally when I do this presentation, you know, I'm talking about how I would uh, work with a client on this, and um, when I'm working on someone's resume and I take the one they already have and I put it into this format, um, a lot of times things show up like where is all of the metrics? Where's the data? Where's the, you know, wh where did you move the needle? And so you can see in some of these yellow areas, the kinds of questions I'd ask a client to fill in. So in this particular um, resume, we had somebody who was uh, working as a product director and had been involved in a lot of, a lot of places here. So you can see that they worked uh, at uh, a company called Telecom and a company called Initech, um, a company called Public Utility. And uh, in here, you can see that, um, that bullets at the top, first of all, where it says the target job title from the job description, we used to put in a resume our objective, right? We'd say, our, my objective is to work at a leading telecom company doing X, Y, and Z. Now, for the sake of the recruiter, they only want to see, they were like, can I get in touch with this person, Techmeister? What job are they looking for? Okay, now I know what they're about. They're going to scan these bullets, and then they're going to look for the keywords and the expertise. Um, if you have something that needs to be told and you're not pre presenting a cover letter, or you want to talk about maybe you had a job for a long time and so there was a big set of accomplishments or something, you can call out two to four things that you did where you want to tell a little narrative. If you're more of a, an executive level person, let's say that you're a senior director or above, you're probably going to want to have a key accomplishment section because you're being a manager and you're getting your, your work done through other people. So you want to talk about what kind of initiatives you led and how you led teams to get to those things. Um, underemployment. Um, this one doesn't really follow the way that we like to do it at JobScan because we do like to have months in there. And uh, this one doesn't have what this just has years. Um, but generally speaking, I like to have months in those resumes. And then the last part I'll just point out before we move to the next slide. Your education and certifications are great. They need to go last. And your tools, your accomplishments, and your expertise need to come first. A lot of times I see resumes where people list their education first, or they list something not super relevant in the first two thirds of the page. Um, and then, they, or maybe they put their, they went to a fancy school or a good school, and so they wanna put that up front. It doesn't make any difference. Keep it in the back. If they're interested in the first two thirds of your resume, like this one, 
Okay, if they read this much and they're like, oh, I like, I really like what I'm reading here, they'll go all the way to your education just to double check. Or in fact, they might not even care, it depends. There's a, there's a growing movement of not caring about college education as much. So that's also not a limitation for people who feel like their lack of education might be getting in the way. So um, that's when you can see kind of up close. Another approach, just to, just to share, is you could put titles on each of these three columns of expertise, and then you can organize them by thematic type. Again, you're just trying to educate a recruiter really quickly. And I think the other feature I want to point out for you guys is um, this, is not in a he this is not in a header, okay? If you, this was up in a header in Word, it wouldn't get read by the scan. So keep it where it can get scan where it's scannable. And then think about it like an outline. You really just want to quickly, oops, sorry guys. You really just want to quickly go through this and um, get this in an outline format because just think about when you have an OCR scanner and you want it to be able to read something, right? The more simple and direct the information's presented, the, the more uh, readily it's gonna go into the system correctly. So work with the process as it is and think about what's gonna happen with this resume when you design it or you put content in it. Here's another example for somebody who maybe is um, got a slightly different take. So this was for somebody who is applying to be a data analyst. And you can see that we kind of get the first qualifications up in the top bullets. The expertise is broken out into you know, three clear columns. And then I like to share this for people who are looking for jobs in tech. I like this tools and technologies section in a resume where you list the languages that you know, um, what, er, what other systems you're using. This could sometimes have as many as eight things in it depending on how sophisticated your career has been and the kind of tools and frameworks you use. So um, well, good rule of thumb for computer languages, for those of you who are um, techies, is list them in the order of your expertise. And if you have a familiarity with the language but you're not fluent in it, I recommend writing familiar with and then putting the language there. Uh, sometimes people put things like Python in their skill list and uh, they're only familiar with Python and they get calls to write on Py to write Python front end or, or uh, you know, whatever they're being asked to do. And then they have to then say, I'm really not that good at Python or they end up doing a whiteboard test for Python. So just be really conscientious that you're also telling them what you're going to be tested on and a whiteboard test, things like that. Okay, so most of you, if, if you're already connected to JobScan, then most of you probably already know how JobScan works and uh, what it looks like. So typically, you know, you'll see here, if you go and do, if you search a resume in JobScan, um, for those of you who've never seen JobScan for whatever reason, it, this is a great way to evaluate your resume against a, a given job description and to see how well it matches using um, all the all the different metrics the job scan produces relative to what ATS systems read so that you can get a sense of like how really well suited are you for the job in this case this particular person who is looks like we were going after Amazon senior project manager they had a 73 percent match rate in job scan for me personally I think that that is about that that's an optimal score I know that JobScan, the company says, try to go for 80, but I've had a lot of people go crazy trying to hit 80% in a match rate. Here's what I've learned over hundreds and hundreds of job submissions with my clients. 55% is kind of the threshold. If you're able to get your resume up to 55% match rate or higher, then your odds are very good you'll at least get a screening call. So for those of you who've been getting, you know, 55, 57, 58, 60% on your match rates in JobScan, um, you can stand. You can be like, okay, I'm gonna stop right here. Remember, the goal of the resume in today's job search is to unlock the key, unlock the lock that gets a person to call you. And then we move to a completely different phase of job search. Sometimes I share with clients, the job search is like playing an old video game from the 80s where you have a ship, right? And the ship's going through some kind of tunnel and things are shooting at you. And, you know, the first few times you play, they shoot and you blow up. And it's like you have one life, so you have to start all the way over again. 
you know? So for those of you who are nerdy enough to know what I'm talking about, like you get to the end of a level and there's like a door and the door opens up and you go through, you don't know what's on the other side of the door and maybe you get blown up again. That's just part of how job search works. So um, we're working our way through each phase at a time. Other coaches are gonna have other approaches. I really recommend that you, you know, spend as much time with all of them. They all have different points of view about how this works. So I have a concept for people, which is, yeah, sure, sounds like you're, I'm gonna to have to modify my resume a lot. And you will kind of at first. So what we really wanna have is um, a, a go-to resume, one that we can call the gold master. Okay, so in the world of recording or any kind of music, um, when you're done making the record, you have, the reason they call it a gold master is uh, they used to print CDs on gold discs to differentiate them from other discs and they had other information on them so you could make a lot of CDs. Okay, so we're gonna make like a master CD that's gold master. So the first thing is you need to know the job titles you're targeting. So out in the market today, you guys have probably noticed this, if you go to LinkedIn or you go to some, or, or Google or any other, any other provider of um, jobs, um, or at least links to jobs, you'll see that the jobs are arranged by title. You need to know what the job titles are for the kind of work that you want to do. If you're just entering or you're switching careers, then you'll need to do research to figure out where is a job I can enter into this new industry at that I'm qualified to get. Sometimes with college grads, I'll recommend that they look for um, jobs that are called administrator or coordinator, recruiting coordinator, marketing administrator, marketing coordinator, things like that. You'll need to have that list of jobs in order to really uh, create this gold master. So how do you find some jobs? Well, not everybody knows this, but Google is great for looking for jobs. And so these are, this is how you plug a search into Google. You put in the job title, that's why you need to know what they are, the word jobs, and then the locality where you're searching for jobs. So if you're a product manager and you're looking for a job in Seattle, it's very clear, right? Product manager, job Seattle. Let's say that you wanna work remote, that when all this COVID stuff's over, you still don't wanna go into the office. Okay, great. Project manager, jobs, remote. You'll get a list of jobs that'll say anywhere, in Google at least. Okay, those are all jobs that accept remote work. So that's a good, and then here's a little hack. If you wanna find remote jobs for companies and you know where their headquarters happens to be, you can put in project manager jobs remote and the locality. And that'll unveil a whole nother set of jobs that maybe you haven't seen before that are being offered as remote or part remote by employers in that city. So if you're in a Seattle and you, um, I've always wished you could do remote work for a startup in Silicon Valley. This is a great way to try to find jobs like that. So here's some best practices. Um, create a spreadsheet. Use Google Sheets or use Excel, whatever you happen to have. Go find some jobs using Google or LinkedIn or both and um, get, get them, record them in your spreadsheet. Don't think about it too hard. Don't try to prioritize them and do not try to make up your mind about whether you really want the job. Okay, this is where people get hung up. They go, oh, that, I don't know. I'm qualified for that job, but I don't know if it's gonna be that much fun. This isn't, this isn't where we're doing that filtering. Okay, find jobs that you're qualified for that match your job description. Get five or more, prioritize them. Then, taking the resume that you have in this format that I showed earlier in the presentation. Optimize it using JobScan. Find as many of the keywords as you can, get to at least 55%, if not higher. Now, you can apply for that job. And by the way, when you're done with this process, I would expect, if we're working together, I'd expect you to apply for, once you've done that, you should apply for the job. Okay, so we're not doing it in the abstract or for fun. We're really trying to do something serious here. Then you take, your, for the resume that you optimize for job number one, and then you go in job scan and you compare it to job number two. And what you'll discover is that job number two has a lot of the same skills using different words. So you wanna go in and modify resume one. 
you'll end up adding more words into your resume. You try not to cut into the words that you just added, if you can remember them, and uh, optimize so that you have now resume number two optimized for job number two with a the idea. And then you take resume that's been optimized for two, compare it to job number three. Follow that process till you've done all five. The fifth job resume is going to be your gold master. And then any other job that you find after that, you'll discover will score very high in job scan, probably at least 45%, if not higher. So now your work has become a lot simpler. So this is a process I'm sharing with you. It's just an iterative process. It's a computer programming style approach that will help you make this resume work a little less tedious and a little more effective for you. And then um, one more thing to know about job scan when you're matching up hard skills and soft skills and all that, you can expect to see your score move up about 1% for every word that you match most of the time. Okay, there, I know there's some other stuff. It's not an exact one for one. But uh, when you make those changes, then you'll see it go up. Remember, if you start at 48%, you only need to find seven or eight words that need to be modified for you to hit that, that magical 55% threshold. So you can see how that might be um, pretty easy to swap words in and out, especially in the expertise category on the resume. Okay, so here's some more info on our friend, the gold master. Okay, this is your baseline for job scan. So once you've done the first five, then um, you can use the fifth resume as your baseline all the time. Sometimes you can always just, you can start with whatever your last resume is. So if you do 10, you know, you might use resume, optim optimize resume number nine to look at job number 10. They're all adding in the language that it's more rich for the jobs where you're looking. This assumes that you have a good idea of what you're looking for in a career or what the roles are. If you're not at that point, if you're still seeking, then um, that's, th this is only gonna help you to a limited degree. But if you know where you're headed, then this will help. Okay, and then we talked about this. This will allow you to start optimizing really fast so that the modifications you're making to the resume are minor um, and only take you 10 or 15 minutes instead of sometimes, I mean, I had some people I've worked with where, before they came working with me, who'd spend hours on one resume and it was really disheartening. Okay, so if that's you out there, I understand your pain, right? If you're just working from scratch or you're not sure where to start, you're trying to get these scores, you're already using job scan, I, I feel your pain. Okay, so this might help you. Okay, remember, we're just trying to get a phone screen with this. <laughs> we're not trying to win a design award for the resume. The computer does not not judge design. The computer only knows whether it can read your resume or not. And the uh, recruiter may judge design if you're a graphic designer. But the rest of the time, you have no idea how ugly the resumes are that they normally look at. So if it's at least pleasing to the eye, you're going to be happy. And then the last little bit here, you can take the info from your gold master about each job that you've done. And you can go back over to LinkedIn. And in the about section for each job that you've had, you could drop in the explanation of the job and the bullets that you generated creating your gold master. That creates a keyword rich, informative blurb about your work for recruiters who are using LinkedIn to find potential candidates. Because if we're gonna to go to all this trouble to optimize for search, we might as well use it every place where it's handy. Okay, and then I'm sure some of you are already saying this, but I paid this designer to do this resume and I don't want it to be a waste. And uh, that's okay, all right? You do, there's a place for your well-designed resume. You should bring it with you when you get your interview. But before that, you may not be able to use it for this other part of the process. And here's some of the reasons why. Resumes that are designed with nested tables, which is, let's say you set up a master table to, for the whole page, and then you started putting tables inside with blurbs of content. Okay, tables inside of tables can't always be parsed, meaning read, by an applicant tracking system, and it can literally block out whole sections of your resume from getting scanned into the system. I've seen this with my own two eyes, especially if you've made 
resumes yourself and you've used pages by uh, Apple. Apple pages, the way that their designs work, they're meant to be graphically pleasing when they're printed out. And uh, they use a lot of nested tables. And a table in a table um, comes up empty. So you could lose a whole set of skills or something that you're trying to present. Just So um, here's a way to test it. If you're in job scan and you've used pages, go to, go to your pages document, select all, copy and paste it into job scan. If it's in a nested table, job scan won't be able to read it either. And you'll notice your score is really low. This is how I figured out this was happening. So um, just a hint from me to you, I, from trying to sort that one out. Okay, things that are really great that people like to have in their resumes. Pull quotes from somebody who they've worked with who has a great title. Maybe the CEO of a company you worked for in the past had a glowing pull quote for you and you wanted to put that in there. Um, that's great, um, but, but there's no place in the applicant tracking system for stuff like that. And so the computer's just gonna be like, what, what is this? And it'll try to do its best to put it somewhere and it could end up anywhere and it could garble your data. Okay, so um, remember, the, you first you gotta talk nice with the computer. I like to use that Arnold Schwarzenegger voice, like talk to computer, right? Uh, to let them know, let the computer know first. So then you can talk to a human about what's in your resume. Um, same thing is true with PDFs. There's the possibility, depending on how you put the document together, that it can scan in and end up scrambled where the headers for one section end up connected to the skills in another section, things like that. So uh, a thing to know about, okay? If you're using PDF, nothing wrong with that. If the best advice you've got is always use PDF, I'm not gonna argue with any other advice that you've gotten. I'm just sharing with you what I've learned, what I've seen you know, personally. Um, you got a great resume. You paid somebody, I don't know, $1,000, $1,200 or something. They interviewed you. They helped you get a resume together that's full of rich, important stuff really great you're going to need that to put into this ats format anyway so you'll just have to do a little cutting and pasting to get anything that's extra or, or uh designerly out of what you're out of it okay it turns out interviewers love the re love your printed resumes that are fancy i thought that resumes as a fancy thing were dead um but i was working with a guy who was out in milwaukee and he said, no, no, I got to bring, I, I have this great resume. I want to bring it in. So I said, well, let, go ahead and do it. So he went in and every interview he brought printed resumes. He says that that's where all of the interviewers took their notes. They wrote it all over the printed resume that he happened to bring into the job interview. So your jobs, that your, your investment is still worthwhile and there's lots of uses for it. Um, it's just not a universal tool anymore. Okay, there's two parts to this now. Um, all right, and then just some best practices. This hasn't changed since I was first looking for jobs in the 80s, okay? Bring at least one paper copy of your resume so that someone can photocopy it. Better if you just bring copies for everybody. And um, just remember that in today's day and age, somebody might cop some attitude about you bringing in a printed out resume that they did not want. So just be prepared to um, be uh, humble about it. They say, why did you print these? You're killing trees or whatever. Okay, don't let them trip you up. Okay, so we're at the point now, we just kind of plowed through this. Uh, actually, we did pretty good. Okay, so um, here's the, the place where I'd like to field some questions. So John's going to go through, it looks like there's been a lot of activity over in the chat. And he'll, he'll read the question out loud to me. And then um, I'll give you guys my best answer. And then we'll do Q&A for a little bit. And then John's got some things he wants to share. And then I've got some information about how you can get in touch with me if you feel, after this presentation, if you feel like I might be able to help you. And I've got a special offer for participants in the webinar. Okay, so um, I'm ready for questions if you are, John. Sure, yeah. So um, as anyone that's been following the chat sees, there's, there's a lot of activity in there. So thank you so much for uh, posting those questions for us. Um, I'm going to uh, do my best to, to ask as many as I can, but I think what we're going to do since we have so many is, you know, the ones that we don't answer, we'll compile into an email and we'll send out to um, all the, the registrants as well. So um, we'll, we'll do our best to answer all your questions here um, 
either here in the session or uh, a little bit later on. So uh, for, first question from I, I got from a lot of people, Tim, is that people are, are interested in, in knowing if they can get a copy of your slides. <laughs> is that something we can? Oh, uh, sure. Okay, so we'll uh, go ahead and send those out after the webinar. Yeah. All right, so Sophie asks, if you're, uh, so you, backing up a little context, you mentioned that um, San Francisco, different culture there, one page resumes um, may be preferred. So Sophie asks, if you're over 40 in San Francisco, would you still have uh, a one page resume? Um, I've seen it both ways. If you're over 40 in San Francisco, I've had clients where I just, I was insistent we do a two page resume. Um, sometimes that, created something new because the employers were used to looking at one page resumes. But I find more often than not that my, my uh, clients that happen to be in the Bay Area inevitably come back and say, I've gotten a bunch of feedback. Everybody t tells me I should have a one page resume. So um, it takes a, just a completely different mindset because you have to edit yourself down to the most essential stuff you've done most recently. Um, for those of you who um, who are out there. I spend about a third of my time in San Francisco, minus this time with COVID where I've been stuck in Seattle. And I do spend a lot of time down there. So um, it is a different hiring culture. And I'd aim to do one page if, if possible. But if it's important to have two pages, two pages works. But probably the feedback will come back to get it down to one eventually. Great. All right. Uh, Debbie Marshall asks uh, that. Uh, so many executive coaches say that uh, a more designed resume is needed for executives to stand out. Um, is that something you can address um, since those are, you know, not as ATS friendly? Yeah. Um, and that it, it, it is a challenge because what it, you'll discover is even if you're an executive, um, they may, a company may want you to actually still apply and put information into the ATS. Um, if they're actively recruiting you, if you're an executive, then um, all rules, all these rules are out the door, okay? Because what, as if it, some of you are, are um, executives out there, you know that executive job search is a completely different animal. It's very relationship based, and um, you may have trouble if you're doing cold approach for executive roles. That said, I've worked with people at levels um, VP, and you know, kind of second in command, chief of staff type roles. And um, we have ended up using the exact same approach. We ended up with a resume that was meant for, a, for getting into applicant tracking systems for when you're going in for a cold approach. And then also a resume that, wa that was um, meant specifically to talk about executive skills. A lot of times we modified the executive resume also and kept it up to date and kept a different version for each job that the person applied for. Same rules though, in terms of like, when you get to the gold standard, what we discovered even with the, this person who um, was working as a creative, creative director was by the time we got to the sixth job, any resume that we'd made would get a higher than 55% match in job scan. And so then it was a question of, do we want to modify anything or not? But it became our choice. Right, so then it was like, well, how bad do you want to go for this job? Like, how, how, how well would you like the glove to fit? You know, so those are, those are questions. They're just part of the new world of job search. So yeah, execs, you, you still want to have something that you can put in an applicant tracking system. They may ask, like, I know Amazon expects you to still. So, um, and I think the same is true for Google, although Google, they have their own way of vetting people. So kind of a different animal. Awesome. Uh, we got a lot of questions about uh, the 10 years experience, you know, what's worth keeping beyond that. Uh -huh. So um, Christina Fernandez asks, uh, if a person has just one job in the last 10 years, would it be okay to include previous jobs on the resume or just keep it to the single job that they've worked for the last decade? Um, it would depend a lot on the continuity into the previous career. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if showing a job that was more than 10 years old showed that you were, that you had moved up, okay, that you, you, you know, that you had advanced in your career, then yeah, I would say you, I would list maybe one more job. Another thing that works, and you guys might remember from looking at when we lost by the 
resumes is they all have those headers. And I have a header section and I call earlier career. And in an earlier career section, I list the name of the job, the employer, the location, and the years. And sometimes that's enough to say, oh, okay, like for example, let's say that you worked as a consultant doing PeopleSoft, you know, and you were, you were an implementation engineer. But you maybe work for a bunch of different contracting companies. You're, you know, basically independent and they'd put you out on jobs. So um, that could be earlier career could be PeopleSoft consultant, multiple companies, 1994 to 1999, something like that. Just says that you were working and that that's more detailed than anybody needs to see on your resume. But uh, it does make sense to list it. What doesn't make sense is to gloss over a lot of experiences and then have one early experience and, and really want the recruiter to care about that early job experience. I've had a few clients that are really attached to like the first big project they ever did. And I'll just say it really bluntly because I care about you guys. Nobody wants to know about that old project. Nobody cares about what you built in .NET. Okay, I don't know how else to say it, but it's just, if it's old tech, it's not doing you any favors. You'd be better off leaving it blank and letting them ask you if they care than to, than to share about old, old glories, right? Or, um, you know, just your MCSE is not the, it, the PMP is the new MCSE for those of you who are old enough to get that joke. <laughs> it, so um, there's lots of old certs and things that just aren't valuable these days. Great. And, and you touched on some of this, but um, Arby would ask for, you know, advice for older workers that have been subject to age discrimination. Do you have any additional tips for, for dealing with age discrimination? Yeah. And, you know, I will, I work primarily with people 45 to 55 years old. They're going, that want to get back into the workforce. And a lot of them are concerned about, you know, there's, a, a, then these things are real. Okay. Ageism is real. Sexism is real. Racism is real. Okay, we encounter these things in our job search. Those things are definitely out there. Um, I always ask uh, anybody who's an older worker, over 40, um, to just ask yourself, do I need to update how I'm showing up for work? Has the work culture changed and do I need to keep up with, with the work culture? Just ask yourself that. You don't need to make yourself right or wrong about it, but just ask if that needs to happen. And then, um, you can take the, exactly what I'm showing you here, okay, this approach. Now, I get part of the secret sauce here, guys, and I, it just is I know exactly how this is supposed to work. And so there's something going down when I'm tinkering with a resume that might be different than what you might do with your own resume. So, you know, that's one factor. Um, that said, this approach works for people of all ages, and I've helped people as uh, 60 and up get new jobs because they were able to get the phone call. Remember, part of ageism is that you give away your age. So if you're using an approach where if your resume looks like it's from 1998, um, just <laughs> the recruiter was four the last time that you really worked on your resume if it looks like it was from 1998. So I'm just trying to put this into perspective. You gotta get yourself in front of these younger workers the recruiters and the recruiting coordinators and everybody else where you're on a level playing field with them by showing up ready to play the game the way it's played in 2020. So um, if you use these approaches, I think you'll have a breakthrough in your job search. I think you'll discover that, um, that wondering whether it's ageism or not, you know, we could, if, if we were working together and we got into the interview process, and it still felt that way, then we would spend some time coaching around, like, how do you get through the interview once you get there? Um, but I, I would say these approaches help mitigate ageism in the job search. That's, that's, what, that's the position I take. Great. I just want to remind everyone, um, especially those that arrived late or, well, first of all, I'd like to apologize for anyone that was uh, blocked from entering Earlier on, we had some technical issues. Um, thankfully, got those resolved. It looks like we got a really good okay. out here. Uh, but um, for anyone else that, that added or joined late, I just want to remind you that we'll have some um, promos uh, here after you know after we're done with this Q and A for for job scan. So um, 
that will include 50 free scans and 50% off job scan premium, uh, either one, whatever works for you. And that'll help you, uh, you know, do some of the things that Tim, Tim was talking about here in this session. So, uh, and so just hold on for that. I'll, I'll post those links in the chat as well as on um, a slide in just a little bit here. Uh, Tim, shifting gears to kind of the other the spectrum, I uh, got a question from April Chen, who okay. said that um, for a graduate to be, uh, the, she, she's heard that you should put education at the top of the resume instead of at the bottom, which is, um, I know the, the way you presented this was to really de-emphasize the, the education, but for recent grads, how, how would you um, recommend tackling that? Uh, depends on whether or not there's been any internships or other experience. Um, I could see now this information I present, I'm, th this isn't a hard and fast rule of law about how to go about your job search, right? So if you have other information or a different data point from somebody else and, you, and that feels more true to you and feels like the right move to make, then, you know, I say, go, go for it. Find out, go find out, right? You can put your, your education at the top and lead. Um, I'd say if you're going for an internship or something like that, it makes a lot of sense. And I, and I want to be really clear about this too. When you're a new grad, getting that first job, if you haven't been on the internship track, can be really challenging. It can be very humbling to spend six months or a year once you've moved home trying to get your career kick started. So, you, you know, there's a fun, if you can get an internship, and I know that with COVID, right, that a lot of internships got canceled. But if you can get an internship um, and get that work experience and cultivate those relationships to get recommendations from other people, that's essential. You know, for, for people in my generation, a lot of us worked from the time we were teenagers. A lot of us had high school jobs. I know that doesn't exist now. My son's 17, and the, the idea of him going to work and trying to keep up with, with school is not, I can't even see how that could be possible. So if you don't have a lot of work experience, you may want to lead with your education, but you're still going to have to convince somebody that you, that you know how to work. Um, and so that I would recommend maybe trying to get short-term contract jobs, anything that you can get and that would get you started and help you figure out where your real skills are in the real world of work, because college does not work. I mean, it's, that's probably one of the biggest shames of our society is that we send people to college and then we kick them out and tell them to go to work. And they're not, they're just not even the same. <laughs> they're not even related. <laughs> um, yeah, so similar to, you know, in the same vein of education, uh, Abby asked, uh, should we mention online courses that we completed on a resume? And um, if so, what should they be titled under or, or what heading should they go under? Yeah, I, I, I put a heading and I call it education and certifications. And I list all the formal education that you paid big, big money for first. And then I list, I put the word certificate, colon, and then I put the name of the certificate and what institution I got it from, regardless. Okay, so if you got it from Udemy, no problem. If you got it from LinkedIn Learning, cool, no sweat, right? And if it's more recent, if you did the certification of the training, let's say that right now you're home and You've got extra time and you're doing a bunch of self-enrichment. Great. Put, put the year, if it's the last couple of years and you did it, so it's pretty recent. I sometimes list the years just to say, hey, I'm keeping up. You know, I did a cybersecurity thing for, in, you know, 2020. So I, you know, hopefully that, and hopefully it had some real relevant information and it wasn't just an insurance test. But, you know, like if you got, if you're able to do um, certifications, yeah, I say go ahead and list them. And uh, they might just remember that whatever you put in your resume, someone might ask you about. So <laughs> make sure you feel comfortable having at least a side discussion about the topics of the certificate if you, if you did it. Awesome. Uh, a lot of different questions here about employment gaps, uh, especially, you know, a, a timely question with, you know, what's yeah. going on in the employment situation. So how do you address uh, employment gaps in, on your resumes? Um, great question. This comes up quite a bit. Um, a lot of it depends on what you, what an individual was doing during the employment gap. So um, sometimes people go on an employment gap, but they, they work a couple of consulting jobs or they take a contract or something. Okay, that you want to handle that one way. If 
you've just, you know, if you, if you stop working because you wanted to start a family or you thought you were going to go back to work and you, you decided not to, um, just know what the truth is about your story. And then create a resume like we've talked about in this, uh, in our webinar today. And they will, if you match, right, just remember if the applicant tracking system, it has a threshold. And if your resume gets over the threshold and you're actually qualified for the job, they will call you. You know, it costs about $3,000 to recruit somebody into a company. So the farther you're into a process with the employer, the more they've already invested in you. I just want you to think about this. Okay, the company is invested in finding the right person for the job. And even with COVID-19, and I know we're all watching the news and it seems like nothing is happening, I have to tell you, if you have enough wherewithal to be on a video conference with me this morning, you, there's a job for you out there right now. Okay, people who are, who are able to do video conferencing, work from home and work remote, can still get hired. I had four people get hired um, that I was working with in April. Okay, while well, the everybody's like, there's no jobs. Okay, just, I'm not gonna go into a macroeconomics lesson, but the job tier that is currently unemployed is not the tech sector. Okay, it's the service sector. What used to be the safety sector. I can always go wait tables, we used to say. Okay, that, that part's not there right now. It'll come back, okay? But if you're in the tier where, you're able, where you have an internet connection and you're able to be on a video conference, you can go through an entire hiring process at Amazon right now, okay? And that's what they're doing. So if you apply at Amazon and they decide that you're the person they wanna to talk to, they will phone screen you and then they'll put you on a regular series of interviews just like if you went into the Amazon office and you'd be in a bunch of virtual conferences with all the same cast of characters, the person who wants to hire you, the bar raiser that's trying to trip you up. Okay, all that stuff's going to happen. It's just going to happen online. You know, every major employer is still hiring. They're just not publicizing it because it's bad PR. Great. Uh, well, shifting gears a little bit, um, I had a couple questions uh, about white space on a resume. Uh -huh. um, a different advice about that. So as I ask, uh, um, as a asks, uh, your samples don't have much white space. My career coach advises me to have a good amount of white space. Uh, how do you handle that? You should listen to your career coach. Then I mean, it's okay. Like there's no, there's no, like I said, none of these are rules. I share this stuff with you because it's been working for me. So um, that what you're seeing has worked for lots and lots of people. Okay. Triple digits of people. So, um, if the approach that you're using, uh, um, is getting calls and you're getting opportunities to interview, then that process also works. Okay. There's infinite ways to get jobs. Okay. This is just, this just happens to be the one that I, I advocate. Okay. It's the one I have for sale. And, uh, and that I'm also willing to share with you. So you can have more white space on your resume. If you're a graphic designer also, you know, I really recommend that um, you, if you're a graphic designer, not, almost none of this applies. Okay, so <laughs> let me make sure that I'm real clear about that. If you're a graphic designer, it's about your portfolio and you can have a very minimalist high white space resume. Great, well, we're just about time here. So we had a, a ton of great questions. So yeah. sorry we couldn't get to all of those. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we'll we'll see what we can do about uh, rounding up some of these questions and you right. know writing answers and, and sending them out via email. Right. Um, well, I think that's that's about it for us. Thank you everyone so much for attending. Um, again, we'll we'll do our best to follow up with with those other questions and uh, hope to see you in some of these other webinar sessions. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Appreciate your questions and um, look forward to hearing from some of you. Thanks, Sean. Right. Online listings make applying for jobs easier than ever. So why aren't you getting a response from employers? Easy applications means more applicants, which means more competition. Leading companies use automated software tools called Applicant Tracking Systems, or ATS, that weed out many resumes before they even reach a real person. So how do you cut through the noise? With JobScan. JobScan uses artificial intelligence to get your resume past the filters. We've reverse engineered their systems to create an intelligent tool that provides proprietary insights to optimize your resume at a much deeper level.
so you can tailor your resume for each job based on precise keywords and skills most valued by the company. JobScan can even optimize your LinkedIn profile so company recruiters find you before you even know they're looking for your skill set. Let JobScan maximize your chances with every application. Register for your free account and run your first scan today.